looking at the hand is fair. All right, so I'll just, I mean, I'm going on too long about all this, but I think um, we, were, we were very disorganized. There was no committees, there was never any review, and this was a big point of contention that uh, we needed. People always thought you had to uh, look at portfolios and decide who could be in the I didn't like that. I didn't like it. And uh, in fact, it was Phyllis who said, you know, this was a benevolent dictatorship. So what happened was, uh, in fact, I'll tell you, uh, the naming of Soho <clears throat> was put to the membership. There was a list of uh, choices of names. One was Shotgun, I remember. <laughs> One was Rainbow or something. And uh, the uh, author, the, the creator of the name was uh, John Pothrop, and he was a vice president of the New York Times. And he was uh, an avid photographer, and he uh, was behind this. He said, uh, how about Soho Photo? So it was on the list. And there was maybe six or seven, eight choices. And uh, so we took the, <laughs> everybody voted. We had 80 and 90 members. And <laughs> Atsu and, and Donald and I, we had signed the lease, so I guess we were there. And we went behind this. <clears throat> there was no the space, as you remember. There was one little space that we could hide behind. And we went back there. <coughs> and I just said, OK, let's start counting. Don't count it. We'll count the guy who's going to so <laughs> And that's how we did it. it was, there was the voting one. There was no voting. It was just, Soho was an obvious choice. It may have won. I mean, if we had counted. But, it was, <laughs> but that's how it was. I mean, you know, you can't go over. I mean, Soho photo was brilliant. And he was a vice president. Anyway, that's, that, you know, that's how it started. And uh, I just wanted two, two more quick, quick. Uh, we had, uh, what I loved about that one, the first year, in, in all its chaos, was uh, the serendipity of the way things happen. Uh, there, uh, we had a children's show. All the members sponsored a child. And uh, I, I hate to say it, but I don't hate to say it. It was the best show we had all <laughs> <laughs> Because of the innocence and the, and the directness and the no, no, no egos involved of those children, just like when they're drawing and painting, you know, early on, and then when the eagle kicks in, they're afraid of someone saying, well, that doesn't look like a tree. The photography was just great. And the picture I remember most of the entire year, one picture always stands out in my mind. And it was taken by Johnny Levin, who's five years old. Mike Levin's son. And Johnny Levin was very, very, very comfortable with a light in his hands at five years of age. And he's walking down Fifth Avenue, and his father gives him, says, take a picture, take a picture, take of that man, that man. And Johnny Levin points a picture up, and they're standing in with his jaw drop down, standing there in perfect light, is Otto Preminger. <laughs> <laughs> like that's looking at a five-year-old taking his picture. <laughs> <laughs> and were, yeah, with a light. And so it was just, it was a great, it's a great picture. And I, uh, another Johnny Levin's picture is just looking out a window at a, si a, a single cloud. You're just, a, it's just perfectly framed. It's no nonsense. And there's a cloud. And you know, he said, there's a cloud. Yeah. So that's what that, but one more thing was, uh, my favorite. We used to get, we, we invited all those people, uh, the, all the gallery owners, from, uh, Maggie from the Floating Foundation. There's a picture, if you get a chance to look through here. Uh, Lee Whitkin and uh, Margie Knight, uh, uh, Knight Group. And we invited them down to talk about the gallery and how photographers wanted to know how to uh, become a member or, or how you could show those galleries. And uh, it was a little evening. But, uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what it was. Oh, so Marty so Nyker, a young photographer, I think he's probably 20 years old, and he comes down from Canada looking for a show. Girl uh, Cal. You remember his name? Girl Cal, yeah. That's right. I don't remember his name. Girl Cal. I'm going to tell you. Uh, what? Well, anyway, I'll just tell you first. He goes to Margie Knight. She says, well, there's a, there's a, there's a,
gallery down is taking the young. You should go see them. It was a day of a show, and we were hanging the show. And this kid walks in. <laughs> I said, "Time up now. I won't come up behind." So, <laughs> you remember that? I'll tell. I have to tell you that. He had one glass eye, and you couldn't tell if he was looking at you. That's not important, but. He said, Martin, I said, you know, he says, are you, do you remember? I said, yeah. He says, Martin Negro said, I should come and show you uh, my pictures. And uh, we were trying to hang the show. And one photographer didn't show up for the, so we had three bare walls. And so I, I looked at three pictures. I said, all right, hang them on these walls. <laughs> His eyes started going, oh, my God. <laughs> So he puts up the show, and then within uh, half an hour, he's standing with a glass of wine in New York City. <laughs> 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 you know, these are kind of things that you just can't do. You know? And I uh, thought the pictures were incredible. Yeah. And, uh, and Arno Minkin, uh, he really was extraordinary. Uh, his, 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 his photos, uh, as he explained it, as I remember, he said every day, he photographed his dreams. If he had, if he had a dream, he would, he would try to illustrate it in the photograph. And uh, I remember in particular, there was like footsteps in the sand, there were some panties, frilly pants, tees, <laughs> and footprints into the ocean. And they're very, they're very it's so graphic. If you, if you look up his work, it's, just, it's amazing stuff. And he was amazing then. Uh, I got. I got to just tell you two more things. The idea, the whole idea of Soho was uh, about ideas, and I had run into a dance troupe uh, on Fifth, Fifth Avenue in the summer. There was a festival of dancers, and they were so incredible. All these costumes and this, you know, this, this great dance, and the photo. I go up to them. I say. We have a gallery. Would you come down and choreograph a piece for the gallery? And they said, "Yeah, why not?" So they come down, and it was, I, I, I arranged it. It was during one of our meetings because every uh, week we would some photographers would show up and you know show each other pictures. We we had uh, panels hanging from uh, fire. Uh, what are those things? Uh, the water sprinklers. That's not, That's what we we hung them from the sprinklers. Did you say track lighting? Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> they're bolts. There were bolts hanging down. That's what we had. You probably did not get a fair idea. That was a Zitter Bottom. Track light. Everybody had one. track light. We had gorgeous windows. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, so we took down all the panels, cleared the space before the photographers arrived. Yes. The dancers yes. were in just magnificent costume and makeup and masks. And they hid behind this one little panel that we hid stuff. And uh, a photographer showed up for our weekly meeting. The lesson was to have your camera with you at all times. Because those who didn't have their camera were so upset. <laughs> because they came in, they said, where's the show? The show was gone. There was, you know, along the walls there were, but the, but the panels were gone. 2,500 square feet. And as soon as everyone was there and settled, and they didn't have any idea what was happening. Music came up, and these dancers came out. They had choreographed very uh, quickly a piece, and they danced around the studio. And the photographers went crazy. They were taking pictures, running, and they were part of this part of the dance in a lot of ways. What was interesting? Two things. Uh, after no, no, no. Two things. After, I am going to hurt this cat in about so, one minute. No, thank no, you. No, 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 no. After we took all the, all the photos, put them in a bag. And then we put up a collage of all the pictures. And what was interesting is only one photographer knew her pictures. Everyone else argued about their pictures. Everyone kind of took similar pictures. One photographer only shot the feet. She was doing it with a different point of view than all the Okay, so. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, have more no, no, that's it. Uh, in, 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 in that wonderful collage of memories, Lee said, a key word, or a couple of key words, and I'm not sure you, you, you realize them because it's easy to get lost in those stories. And the key words were 2,500 square feet for $400 a month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
and still couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you could find you could find that you could find enough friends or colleagues to support it. You couldn't do that anymore here in this city, and that that's probably a partial answer to my original question about. Is, is it possible to do this today? Sure, if somebody donates the space to you, you could do it. But supporting a space that size is harder and harder and harder to do. Right? The, 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 the big change in our ability to live la vie bohème is the change in the cost of real estate. So, so with, with, with that sort of interjection, uh, let, let me turn to someone else here who's mouthy. I, I'm thinking of... of